So everyone, good evening. We are about to start. Please have your seats. Take your seats. So good evening again. Yes, now it's working. So good evening and welcome everyone to uh, the forum on making Israeli African innovation. We are very happy to have you here everyone. Uh, we are going to have a very exciting program and talk about how innovation in Africa is made by Israelis and Africans together, by uh, investing our best resources in creating solutions for very pressing problems that we are all discussing here throughout this, uh, this conference. Climate of innovation and innovation climate, there are two different things. We are talking about a new climate where the Israeli spirit is playing an important role in developing African solutions. So what we are going to do today, we are having uh, first some introductory remarks by um, uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Google, will have our panelists present their uh, work in innovation in Africa, in Israel, as regulators, as practitioners, um, and then some pitches of regarding developments that have been made for Africa, with Africa, um, and that inspire us all. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker, uh, Director General of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Ambassador Alon Ushpiz. Alon, please. Thank you, Ido. Ladies and gentlemen, this is important for us. According to the Office of the UN Special Advisor on Africa, the agricultural sector uh, in the continent employs about 65% of Africa's workforce. At the same time, Africa has the lowest productivity per capita. And we have to ask ourselves why and what should we do about it. We is together, Israelis and the, uh, the people of Africa. Israel has attached great importance to cooperation with African countries since almost 70 years ago, from the days of the late Golda Meir our Prime Minister. Much attention has been focused on supporting and jointly combating the devastating effects of, uh, of climate change, uh, particularly desertification and diminishing uh, food security. And this co uh, cooperation has rested on historical mutual commitment and interests, shared values, necessities, and needs. And it has manifested itself uh, mainly by exchange of knowledge, experience, and technology, but above all, by long years of connections between people. By developing and implementing advanced technology no innovations, etc., both Israeli and African interlocutors have booked themselves successes throughout the years. We can name a long list of those but let me start with a relatively recent example, and that's the highly effective use of advanced drones in Ethiopia to combat Loctus plague in, in November 2020. Similarly, the Rwanda Israel uh, uh, Horticulture Center of Excellence that was set up two years ago has provided the basis for a long-term Israeli-African partnership for innovative solutions in the horticulture development. Climate change, ladies and gentlemen, is a global challenge and requires an all-hands-on-deck approach in terms of international uh, collaboration, but also on a bilateral level between different governments. Governments, international organizations, private sector, civil society, all of us need to combine efforts 
and to be as effective as possible. In Israeli eyes, success in this context is measured by not only resolving a uh, pressing problem by itself, but also by being able to create an infrastructure, an ecosystem, and uh, solutions that we, uh, that we can measure. And this is exactly the aim of another example uh, of our partnership with uh, Ethiopia Digital Foundations project. This endeavor for digital development is managed by the Ministry of uh, Innovation and Technology and financed by the World Bank. Israel's role is to support the creation of an ecosystem that encourages entrepreneurship and innovation led by the Israeli Innovation Authority, the National Digital Agency, as well as the Ministry of Agriculture. Developing an ecosystem for adequate solution is also the goal of the iFair model, which combines ingenuity, innovation, and uh, entrepreneurship, and is supported by a group of committed international partners, all these being driven by the unique Make Lab Technological Community Laboratory, iFair Nigeria, has produced impressive results and drawn commercial investment, which is another indispensable component. We aim to expand this uh, model to other African countries, hopefully with the collaboration uh, with Google, United Nations, and others. Last year, Israel Ambassador to Addis Ababa presented his credential as permanent observer to the chairperson of the AU, the African Union Commission. This formal status, which we perceive as a very significant development, provides us and our partners in Africa as another channel to expand our work with African uh, partners on continental initiatives such as the agen agenda of uh, 2063. And one such effort is the Great Green Wall project where Israel government and private sector propose to support the search for innovation and R&D. Let me summarize it by maybe three or four points. This is really important for us. We cannot do this without a partnership between us and, and the people of Africa. A lot of this is going to be the, uh, based on, uh, on technology, and we very much appreciate and very much grateful for the uh, international partnerships that we have, including with international organizations and private sector like Google. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Ushbiz. Next, uh, it's a great honor and pleasure to invite our next speaker, uh, Kate Brandt. As Google Sustainability Officer, Officer, Kate leads sustainability across Google's worldwide operations, products, and supply chain, coordinating with data center, real estate, and product teams to ensure that the company capitalizes on opportunities to strategically advance sustainability. Kate, the floor is yours. Good evening. Thank you so much for inviting me to be here with you and uh, much appreciation to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for this invitation. I'm Kate Brandt. I'm our Chief Sustainability Officer at Google. And I'm so happy to be a part of this event. I really resonate with the remarks that you just shared. Um, it really brings forward, I think, the strengths that we have both across Google and Israel in our shared efforts to achieve sustainable development. So I think it's a wonderful topic for us to be focused on this evening. And when we look at societal challenges like the climate crisis, and especially in emerging markets like Africa, I think it's useful to look at the pillars of digital transformation that offer both solutions and remedies. And at Google, we talk about something that we call digital sprinters framework. And this identifies four pillars, and one of those is technology innovation. With both Google and Israel, we both excel in this area. The African continent, as we know, is disproportionately affected by the global climate crisis and by environmental challenges, causing unprecedented damage and devastation. 
And for this reason, I think it's an incredible strength to bring together leaders and entrepreneurs and researchers from Google, Israel, and Africa to collaborate and bring cutting edge innovation and solutions to life. And as our CEO Sundar Pichai recently said, Africa is the place where innovation begins. We believe technologies such as AI and machine learning have a very key role to play in addressing the climate emergency that we are facing. Many solutions that Google is working on actually originated in Israel and are being developed by our research team that is in Israel and in Africa. And we work closely under the leadership of my wonderful colleague, who some of you may know, Professor Yossi Matias, who is our VP for engineering and our head of Google R&D and our center in Israel. So I, I wanted to share with you a few examples of the incredible work that our research team has been doing to address the climate crisis. The first area is around crisis response. As we know, we're seeing increased impacts of natural disaster in their frequency and their severity. And one that's affecting hundreds of millions of people around the world is flooding. And so our research team in Israel began looking at how could we use AI insights to provide more accurate and more timely flood alerts to populations to save lives. And so this work began in 2018. It was an Israel R&D project. And since then, we have been scaling up this work, uh, first in India, then in Pakistan, to Bangladesh. And we just announced last week a really important expansion of this work to 15 river basins, 15 countries across Africa, everywhere from Cameroon to South Africa. Another key area of focus for our research team has been helping farmers to protect their crops. We know that we're also facing food security crisis. And one major issue is pest infestations that can impact entire crops, the livelihoods of millions of people. And so in collaboration with an organization called InstaDeep, and also working with the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations, our team at our Google AI Center in Ghana is working on using AI to address the problem of detecting locust infestations so that it's possible to implement control measures and prevent them from spreading and getting worse. And then the third great example is some work that our team has been doing around enabling more accurate and local building data. So under the leadership of our Israel research team, our AI lab in Ghana is using satellite imagery and machine learning to detect about half a billion data sets available for public use. And so we now have this data for 50 countries and it's being used by UN organizations, by governments, by nonprofits, for various applications, things like understanding the energy needs of buildings or managing humanitarian response after crisis. So alongside these efforts that are really focused on our deep emphasis at Google on AI and the power of AI as a climate solution, we're also developing ways to partner with entrepreneurs to really grow this ecosystem because this isn't just about Google and our development, it's about this whole entrepreneurial ecosystem to address the climate crisis. And so my wonderful colleague, who's here, Erwin, who will share much more in a moment, um, three years ago started the Google for Startups Sustainable Development Program. And I had the great pleasure of announcing this alongside Professor Matias um, almost exactly three years ago. So this is a program that supports startups which are focused on the 17 UN Sustainable Development Goals, which I can see on the wall actually right across the way from us here. And this initiative, it began in Israel. It has been led by Irwin throughout from inception to now working with 300 startups. And the program is really focused on three things. The first is providing advice. We have Googlers that come and provide expertise to these startups to help them unblock, accelerate, inspire as they develop their business models. We also give them advice around funding, around how do they scale, how do they get access to capital, engage with the venture capital community. And also technology. We know that sustainable development can't scale without access to technology. So we're also providing advice on the use of things like cutting edge AI. And as part of this program, we're able to engage with these incredible innovators. And I, I just wanted to share a couple of my favorite examples that, you know, Erwin has been updating me on all the progress of the program for many years. 
One is an organization called OKO. This is an Israeli startup, and we were talking a little bit about crops and the food security crisis. They're focused on crop insurance to keep farmers in business in case of adverse weather events. And they're reaching tens of thousands of farmers now in Mali and Uganda. And here today, we will give a deep dive presentation on their work, so we'll hear more about that soon. And then another wonderful startup that's been part of the program is called Zap Malaria. And they're an Israeli startup. They're using artificial intelligence to fight one of the world's deadliest diseases, which of course is malaria. And Zap has been operating now in six African countries, reaching impressive results in their field trials. And then they're actually using that open buildings data set that I just mentioned a moment ago so that they can locate people's homes in order to have more accurate treatment and assessment options. And earlier this year, we had the opportunity to connect with MFA. And what we learned was that we have very similar goals in supporting innovation for impact in Africa. And this really reinforces our common interest in developing this ecosystem in Africa. It's a natural thing, we think, for us to be joining forces here, public and private sector, global innovation leaders, to amplify and to accelerate innovation. So today, I am very excited to start a new collaboration between Google and the Israeli government to support entrepreneurs, starting with Ghana. By bringing the best of Google, our experts, our technology, our network, and partnering with the Israeli government and their experience running programs for the last three years in Africa, we believe we will complement each other in our mission to empower African entrepreneurs to tackle challenges in Ghana and to the broader Africa. So together we will develop this program next year to support African entrepreneurs locally that are working on sustainable development. So I would really like to thank again the Israeli Ministry of Foreign Affairs and especially um, to Edo for their partnership. This is truly important opportunity for public-private organizations to come together and to work on some of the world's most pressing issues. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kate, for sharing this with us. Uh, so next, we move to our panelists. It's your, your up. And uh, what we'll be talking about is about uh, innovation, whether it's in government or private sector. And allow me to introduce yourselves, and then we'll start. So from the left to the right, Avi Osfeld is an Israeli high-tech entrepreneur, investor, and social activist, founder and leader of the Make Lab Network Community and Innovation Centers, founder and CEO of Castup incorporated active in technological fields, including robotics, IoT, making and social entrepreneurship, teaching engineers in academic programs in Afeka Tel Aviv Academic College, and the chairman of Rapid Prototyping Branch at AEAI. Avi is also a natural maker and a creator of many inspirational trans installations. He likes physics, physical programming, motorcycle trips, and innovation of any kind. So, welcome, very happy to have you. Irwin <laughs> Butbul, you're not, you're not free to go yet. No, that was not the point. Irwin Butbul, with a master's in computer science, he joined the IBM Watson Research Center in New York in the early days of the internet. He then did a short stint at Lehman, Lehman Brothers and observed the 2008 financial crisis from the front row seat. After this life-changing experience, he joins Google and focuses, focuses his efforts on social impact, leading the development of donation platforms for Google and YouTube. He is now based in Israel, where he's founded the Startups for Sustainable Development Program, a global initiative to support impact startups that address the sustainable development goals. So, welcome. <laughs> and last but not least, Shira Levami, who is an expert on impact technology. As the CEO of a national digital agency, she is responsible for leading Israel's digital transformation and utilizing innovation to improve governmental work and processes and services. She has a multi-sector experience in utilizing technology for public impact as the CIO of the Israeli Ministry of Health, as the CIO of Israel's leading phil philanthropic foundation, and as an innovation manager for Israel's largest civil society organization. 
In recent years, she has spent time promoting innovation in the private sector as a co-founder and CEO of a digital health startup and promoting a national climate innovation program. So welcome, Shira. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we'll start. Avi, you start with your presentation. Please keep the time in mind, and uh, we'd like you to leave some time for questions. Mike, you want to talk from here, from there? Amir? Okay, thank you. I don't know how, how to talk, so I bought a lot of slides. So keep focusing on the slides. I'll, I'll, I'll run very fast. There are many slides. Okay, sorry. Okay, so the solution for climate problems is, or many climate problems is, so for the cliche, you know, innovation, 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 innovation. We keep speak about innovation because we all understand that actually innovation is the engine for the progress of the human kind. So we need more of that innovation. The problem is that we can't buy innovation in the grocery. I, I tried Google, you know, if you can, can go to innovate in large organizations and, you know, the answer is like, uh, well, it depends, it depends. Actually, it's not. So we can, we can do some things, some regulations. Uh, we can uh, do, give grants and uh, laws and penalties. And so we can also go for the, from the other uh, side and you know, use the education and uh, general awareness and so on. But is this is enough? Is this is practical? Is this, can, can this, uh, is this can push someone to be innovator? Well, it can help, but it's, it's, not, it's not enough. It's not enough. We all know that. We all have motivation to, to solve many problems, but we are not doing that, that because maybe we don't think that we are capable of doing so or, or so on. So is there a process, a clear process for innovation? No, there is no clear, clear process for innovation. We are trying, we are trying all the time. And we see, you know, big companies there, they don't innovate so much. They usually they buy small companies because they, because the the real innovation comes from the ground level. If you have a, an amazing idea, so maybe you leave your corporate and start your startup, and then the corporate will buy your startup. So I'm not going to go into this as a as a big uh, big thing I can say. But as an uh, someone who acts in the Israeli uh, high tech industry for many years, an entrepreneur, an investor, I see hundreds of startups, so maybe I can, I can say there is, there is at least one, one process which I, I can see somehow, you know, people are exposed to technology tools, they enjoy it, they enjoy it, they acquire some skills, they, they, they use it for, to, to tackle small, ch small challenges, they, they have small success, and so on, they enjoy again and again and again, and then in one point they have some confidence and self-confidence and experience, and sometimes this comes with their original original knowledge of in, a, in another area and this combines together and, and create that uh, innovation or it comes from creativity and so on. So this is why I founded the, the Make Club, the Make Club uh, Network. The Make Club has two legs actually. One is a community, a community of people who likes uh, technology and making, yes, like makers, creativity. And this is the actually the fuel of innovation. And the other leg, leg is the physical centers, physical makeup centers, you can find their interesting equipment, tools, uh, fabrication means, all the things that people like to, to play with. Uh, and of course, inspiration and knowledge and experts and volunteers who, who help you uh, to create your, your thing and you can explore and experience and meet. This is the second leg. So actually the Makeup Networks is platform for creativity and innovation it place to develop, develop your own ideas into physical solution or prototypes, and it's the home for entrepreneurship programs from mediation to commercialization. Yes, 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 okay, I'll not go into, into the things that you can find in the Make Club Center because this, this can take a lot, but it's very dynamic, a lot of toys, a lot of things, manufacturing uh, stuff and so on. You can see a lot of, uh, a lot of things like that, but also some explanation, some uh, things you can uh, experience, like uh, the EEG helmet or something like that. Okay, that's, uh, if you want to play with, you can come to, to the Make Club and do it. 
Uh, and also we manufacture ourselves uh, things that we can help. So we, who, are the, who is the audience of the, of the Make Club? This is very important. This is my vision, okay? The, the, the audience is the widest range possible audience, okay? I really want that real mashup, okay? So first we have the, the public use. People can come and join. I, I'll, I'll run very fast, but you can, uh, you can make a stool there, and you can make an artificial intelligent robot, uh, computer vision, whatever, okay? So we, you can see a lot of people experiencing and build things and so on. And yes, you see a lot of, uh, a lot of women because this is something uh, important to us, of course. Uh, and, and we are creating also community, community projects. I'll go, go all over this. And the second, the second group, the acad academic, academic and youth and so on, uh, you can see students come, it can be organized or not organized, okay, it can a student or a class or someone uh, come to, to make his project. And you see this a lot, you see a lot of students, uh, academic uh, programs and so they come. Here you can see, for example, uh, David, David is a retired person who works as a volunteer in the Make Club and I think every day he's helping students a day, on a daily basis. He's like uh, working with students, it's very nice to see. Uh, thing. This is, by the way, in Ghana. It's a new, I just came back from there a week ago. It's a new establishing uh, Make Lab. We have uh, great partners there, the um, uh, Academic City University College. And it's just, uh, we just started. It's, we, we don't even, even, even have uh, tables, but they, are, they already work. They work, they work and experience and so on. This is uh, in Ghana. This is in Abuja. We also have a great partner there, uh, Innovate. Um, the third group is the private early stage entrepreneurs and we're coming to, to, the, to the subject here, okay? Yes, I know, I know, but we, it's okay. I, I'll not elaborate on this, okay? I'll not elaborate on this. This is, by the way, one, one startup. I'll, I'll say it's a very innovative startup. It came into us uh, uh, a few months ago to get help with some uh, designing of a, of a very innovative thing. And, well, we helped him, but in in, in two or three weeks, he got also, we managed to set him for investment of half a million dollars from, from, from us because he thought it's very, very nice. Okay, so, and the fourth group, this is important, and maybe I guess this is why I'm here, uh, is the, the programs. This, uh, the Make Labs are a place or home for programs, entrepreneurship pro programs. Um, and uh, people can come and join this program, and we're doing this in Africa. The second year uh, in a row in IFER, amazing, amazing, amazing project. I, I will not have the time to go over the project, but really amazing, amazing projects, uh, from ideation to, uh, to commercialization. And, and the areas uh, who the Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, decided to focus are, of course, uh, of course, those areas, uh, you know, okay, ecological areas, and so on. Uh, I'll, I'll go. I'll go fast. I'll not go, I'll not go into the into the. Yes, it's one minute. One minute. Okay. Yeah, this, uh, I'll, I'll go over. I'll, I'll not. Uh, I'll not go over this project. This is, by the way, Antin and Blinken. It's not really important. <laughs> it was in the make up. And the, the fifth. The fifth group is the industry. I'll not go into this, but the industry, of course, is the is. Um, helping us and we are helping the industry. It's a bi-directional uh, bi thing. So they come and make brainstorms and, uh, and uh, uh, workshops and so on. So Make Club Network is, uh, I've done it to that. Mm -hmm. This is the my, my last, okay, almost my last, uh, my last uh, slide, okay? So how we do it, okay? This is important for you if you want to set up a Make Club in your place. We locate a local partner. A good local partner can be a government, an academic, a municipal, or private sector. Uh, we set up a make club together with our, or with the help of our uh, our partners, and two of them are sitting here now. I can say two. Yes, it's a Minister of Foreign Affairs and Google, of course. It's a new a new thing. And I, I'm happy with that. We settle down and we set uh, the programs together with the partner, and so on. This is just a. Just the pictures from last week. We came from Accra, uh, from Ghana. Uh, very uh, new, and I'm, I'm really glad about that. So I'll, I'll just uh, stop here, I think, one minute. Okay. All right, I'm next. Thanks, Avi. Amazing stuff.
everyone. I'm going to talk to you about what we're doing with uh, startups at Google with a high focus on Africa. Uh, do I keep clicking here or do we switch the presentation? All right, so I get started. Um, so the program we've been running for the last two years from Israel is called Startups for Sustainable Development. And what we're trying to do here is to activate an ecosystem of impact entrepreneurs, for-profit entrepreneurs that are leveraging technology to advance any of the 17 sustainable development goals. When we talk about the impact ecosystem and in particular startups, there are important aspects that differentiate those entrepreneurs from the regular startup ecosystem. And we created this program to tailor to the specific needs of impact entrepreneurs. Number one, they need long-term support. When you're an impact entrepreneur, it's not like a, a five-year exit you're looking at. Usually impact takes 10 years or more. So we need to support those entrepreneurs over the long term. Now, when you say long term, that also means that investors are less interested in supporting you, unfortunately. The typical VC, even so-called impact VC, are usually looking for returns uh, five, seven years. And that doesn't match the timeline of impact entrepreneurs. So those entrepreneurs have issues ar around resources. And last but not least, they are mission oriented. So for them, what's important is to have an impact and not so much to be the next unicorn. And because of that, they're more open to collaboration. And that's why we see a big opportunity to connect those entrepreneurs with one another, with relevant organizations, in order to accelerate their impact. So this is what we, we created. We created a global community of entrepreneurs that are working towards those goals. And what we do is we help them on three pillars. The first one is advisors, connecting them with relevant experts inside Google and outside Google, with relevant organizations, UN organizations to help them. On the funding side, we help them on their pitch and connect them with relevant sources of capital, whether it's philanthropic capital or investment capital. And last but not least, and this is where we have a unique value proposition coming from Google is that we provide platform technology and I'll do a deeper dive on this one. All of those pillars that we support the entrepreneurs with, we do it with an impact lens, an impact focus to make sure that we measure, collect the data around the impact and use that to help them accelerate their goals. So when you talk about early stage entrepreneurs, and most of the impact entrepreneurs today are early stage because it's still a nascent ecosystem, especially in Africa, we are very, very uh, new entrepreneurs. The challenge they face is that they don't have the skills, they don't have the expertise on a number of topics, and because they also don't have the resources, it's very hard for them to develop. And those could be any topics like HR, uh, engineering, how do I build my team, how do I prepare my pitch deck. And this is where, through our domain expertise, through our network of experts, they can ask for help and we connect them. And we've seen tremendous value for those entrepreneurs in leveraging those resources. Basically, we want to offer them big corporations like Google as an extended workforce for them. So we teach them how to leverage those resources and encourage them to do so. On the funding side, we're really trying to create some unique opportunities by merging the typical philanthropic investments and the typical VC investment. And today, those two pockets of investments are working independently in silos. And what we're trying to do is bridge the gap between those two types of investors to create new vehicles of investment that are relevant for the impact entrepreneurs. So as Google, we use our brands to connect various organizations and make those discussions happen and create that new type of investments. And last I mentioned, but not least, the platform technology we think is critical. Because of the scale of the program, we are able to get insights from hundreds of impact entrepreneurs all over the world. And we identify some building blocks, platform technology building blocks 
that are missing in the ecosystem. And then we work with our research teams to develop the right technology, most often using AI, to provide those data sets and those missing blocks. I give you a concrete example. We are working right now in Africa, in particular in uh, Rwanda, we're starting a pilot where we're using satellite imagery to find the location of the farms, the boundaries of those farms, the type of crops that they're raising. And this type of data is critical for the entrepreneurs in Africa to build their solutions. Entrepreneurs like uh, Oko that we give a presentation later, uh, Simon is here. They need this data in order to really scale their operations. And so we are leveraging our research teams and making this data available for the African entrepreneurs. Just in numbers quickly, we have 300 startups, 70 countries, a high focus on Africa. We have more than 60 startups in Africa that we support. And this is across all 17 SDGs in Africa, a high focus on food security and agriculture. And last but not least, I said impact measurement is critical. If we want to drive impact on those SDGs, we need to collect the data and we need to understand it. And the reality on the ground is that those impact entrepreneurs that are developing solutions for small older farmers or education or healthcare, they don't have impact measurement in the back of their head. In the back of their head, they're like, hey, we need to teach those kids. We need to help those farmers get out of poverty. But they don't think in terms of metrics that relate to the sustainable development goals. And this is where we come in and we try to bridge the gap and help them articulate their important impact in terms of numbers that relate to the UN and other organizations that are interested in funding them. And we see this as critical to not only those entrepreneurs, but to the ecosystem. If we really want to have an impact on climate change, we need to do it from a data-oriented way. That's it. One minute for you. Thank you. So uh, my name is Shira Levami, and I'm head of the Israeli National Digital Agency, which is part of the government, working to help the, the entire government go through the digital transformation that needs to happen in order to make the government do its job better. And we're very interested in how we can help the climate ecosystem move forward. I'm going to say a little bit about that and talk about how this connects to Google, how this connect to connects to what we're doing with Africa. So. I hope. I'm not sure I need it, but it's okay. It's very, very short, but concise. And if you want to take just one thing from this very brief lecture, it would be this slide, okay? What's happening now is that we're in the midst of the next industrial revolution. We've gone through several phases during the years. Some of them have been based in the physical world of innovation. Ch things changed in the actual world when we invented the steam engine and started the mechanization of the world, when we invented electricity and industry and started mass production. It changed society, it changed innovation, it changed everything that we know today as the world. And the next phase that's now happening is the climate transformation. We're changing everything about the way we build the way we use energy, the, our infrastructure, the food we eat, all of these things are now changing dramatically because we're going through the zero carbon technology revolution. The other kind of, of uh, industrial revolution that we've gone through in the, in the last century has been digital. So we invented the computers and automation, and that happened about a century ago, and then about two decades ago we invented the internet and had connectivity changed the way we do everything, changed the way we connect, the way we think about, the way we learn, the way we communicate. Everything is changed in this additional jump. And the next phase that we're now going through is using cloud, digital, data, AI, all these nice buzzwords are coming together and changing the way we operate. And what's fascinating about these co-revolutions is the convergence. What's happening now is they're converging to create a combination between the climate technological revolution that's happening in the real world and the digital revolution of AI and cloud and additional tools that we're using. And this is where we come in. This is where Israel can help. It's, it's where we have a unique advantage. And if you look at the startups outside that are d displaying what they do, this is what they're strong at. They're connecting the real world challenges that we can see in Africa and real world innovation 
with the digital tools that provide us with solutions that were not otherwise possible. So what, what kind of things can we do oh, Sorry, with the use of, of digitally enhanced climate innovation? Okay, we can enhance R&D. I'll, I'll do the next one, but I'm not going to read it. I'm just going to give you a few examples of how this works and how this helps us move forward on an exponential scale. First of all, if we want to do R&D in real world labs, not in, on computers, which is much easier. So we want to develop the next innovative uh, uh, alternative protein. It costs a lot of money to experiment, to take the next one and try it out. And we want to know that what we're trying is the one that's really going to succeed. So we use AI and algorithms in order to find the ones with the most potential and only develop them to the next phase. We want to use, we use digital, digital tools to do policy modeling. Which interventions or which systems or which of these startups will have the most impact on GHG emissions? We can do that today using models instead of trying to figure it out or, or doing guesswork like we used to do in some other things. We use AI to monitor if it's crops, if it's uh, fires, if it's locusts, like Google said before, like Kate gave us an example. The next phase would be to use decision support systems. We want to know where the next thing to do, where we need to intervene. How do we need to create our energy grid in order to flow in order to have the best possible flow and use of energy from different sources and small microgrids connecting together. And the next phase would be to actually do it automatically. Okay? The operational optimization is saying we're replacing our manual sluggish decision making with decision making done by machines that can do a better job. It can create automatic transport routes for for automatic, for autonomous vehicles, for example, that are optimized for emissions. It can create renewable energy usage that happens automatically and, and pricing that is done dynamically in order to control the supply and demand to the best of our ability using all of these technologies that we have. So what are we doing in this, in this area? What is our role? Israel is now going through a, a cloud transformation, moving to what we call Nimbus, which is the national cloud innovation platform. And what we can do to help encourage innovation and connect the dots between the physical innovation world and the digital innovation world is making data available. That's very difficult in the government, by the way. Nobody wants to give out any kind of data. We want to save it all under our desks and hold on to it because maybe it will lay golden eggs one day and taking out this information into the public domain and utilizing it is very difficult, but that's part of what we need to do. Creating public-private par partnerships for R&D, like the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is doing here with Google, is a, is a wonderful example. And international collaboration, problems of climate. The climate emergency is not local, it's global, and we need to be able to work together in order to achieve these innovative solutions. They're much more difficult than they sound. The buzzwords are fascinating and fun but the actual work is very difficult and the uh, enter entrepreneurs will give us a few of their experiences going forward. It, it's harder than it looks, it ha it's harder than it seems when you go into it. I can tell you as a, a previous startup that failed, by the way, so I got all the learning out of that. And, and what we're trying to do is create the platform, create the infrastructure in order to enable this to happen, happen much faster, happen through the community, through the connections of different startups, and happen on scale. Thank you. Thank you very much, guys, for these uh, amazing presentations that you managed to do in uh, such a short time, squeeze into this uh, short time. Uh, we'd like to take some questions now. Um, and I have some questions for you. Each one of you can pick uh, one or two. There are two questions that I think would be interesting for the audience. One is how do you enhance innovation? We're talking about innovation. We're talking about younger group of people, mostly, most of the time young people. But what about the, let's say, the middle range between 30 and 60? How do you educate? How do you instill the idea of innovation there? And the second part is, how do you measure innovation? 
uh, even you alluded to measurements, but not to innovation, but something else. So how do you measure that? How do you make it concrete in terms? And one remark, Shira, about the connection between the physical and the um, uh, technological. Uh, not only government, we had a very interesting discussion earlier today with Avi and a guy named Yossi Oud, who is uh, doing a wonderful project called Bees for Peace. And they had a very interesting conversation together, one coming from nature, from nature, and one coming from the technological side. Very physical, by the way, it's a physical lab. So it's a very interesting discussion. So though outside government, it can also work. So guys, um, let's start with these questions. Um, Avi, go ahead. Okay, maybe I'll give a long, a long answer, but then it's, it's on the, I you know, I, I'll give a short answer on the other question, okay? So, uh, because uh, this, is, this thing is, uh, is really important to me, how we, how we encourage people like 30 to 60, it, it's, it's, great, uh, it's a great question. And I think innovation, it's m many times innovation is, is about multidisciplinary approach. Uh, this is how innovation happens, we see it a lot. The problem that people, you know, uh, and, uh, and uh, how we say, the adult people, you know, they have their own own mind, they have their own way, they, they learn something, they know how they're experts with something, and now they're looking for the answers in their comfort zone, so where they're looking the answers where they, they, are, they are experts with, and this doesn't lead to a great innovation. So if we want to encourage people to, have, uh, to, to be innovative, we should expose them to other disciplines. Uh, this is very, uh, this is, uh, in my, as, as, as far as I see it, when sometimes we see someone who's really expert in something and then he gets a bit more, uh, some knowledge on other things and, and the whole world is open for, for him. I'll g I want to give an example. Uh, in the Mac Lab, we're, uh, we're teaching a lot of uh, uh, Arduino. So anyone knows who, what is Arduino? Okay, Arduino is a small computer. Uh, it's a micro co microcontroller that you can program. Today it's cost about $3, $5, okay? You can program and you can connect it to many kind of devices like uh, sensors and actuators and uh, everything you, you like to create a, like a gadget or like a, like a control system. You can control uh, big vehicles. You can control uh, pumps or, uh, or any, any, any equipment. And this is not like a high-tech thing that you have to learn and, and, and get a, a scholarship in order to program this Arduino. And we see people uh, that know nothing about, about programming and they come and they learn a, some programming and now they build, uh, build some control system of something at their home or something. And now you see, sometimes you see like a uh, taxi driver he sits near an engineer, and this one sits near an architect and a designer and an artist, and they are all uh, busy with the problem of how to make, uh, I don't know, some, uh, a plant in a pot uh, asking for water. With, I mean, like voice, he's asking, it has some immunity sensor, and the, and the plant is like asking, give me water, give me water. So it's a nice thing, everyone is happy. And after two lessons, they have such a, such a gadget that, that, that uh, begs for water when he needs water. But you see after two weeks or something, the guys come and you know what? I have some, something at work, which I, I thought that I can, now I, I think I can solve with this Arduino thing. So this comes the innovation. When someone knows, uh, uh, it goes to a, a new discipline. So this is, this is how I think it's important to uh, it's it's important to do to expose people to other disciplines. Thank okay. you. Sure, long answer, but uh, okay. I'll skip that. I'll give a short answer. So they say everything they that was invented before you were seven was always there, and anything invented after you were thirty-five is is from the devil, because we're not used we're, we're not willing to take any new kinds of technology. And the answers of how to implement innovation are two. First of all, the technology has to be really, really good. In order for us to be willing to eat alternative proteins as meat, it just has to taste good. It has to 
feel right. It has to be <coughs> developed in a way that we want to consume it. That's the first part. The second part that can help along the way is regulation. It can help starting out with incentives. It can start in the end. In 20 years, it's going to be illegal to eat meat, so we're going to have to find alternatives, but passively. But regulation can definitely help us speed things along and, and move there. What I, I would less recommend is trying to train people and teach them. Because I don't know how many of you were taught how to use Gmail. Okay? If you need to be taught, it's not good enough. And what we need is technology that really solves the problem in a way that's so friendly and user usable that we don't need to learn how to use it. Okay, thank you. I think it's an interesting question, this innovation thing, because one of the challenges of the program is that we get a lot of startups that are using technology and we're not going to support every startup that is using any kind of technology. Like at the end of the day, what is technology? Is using the internet technology? So if you have a website, does that qualify as technology? Or do you need to do uh, deep learning on the next uh, molecules that uh, are going to power your meal? So. This is a question that comes back and for us, how we look at innovation is try to do something that is one, impactful because we're looking at impact first, but two, something that's not been done before at scale or something that we don't see yet mainstream as being replicated. And so when we look at it from that lens, it opens up the door to various types of innovation. I'll give you some concrete examples. Uh, for example, we have a startup uh, in Tunisia that we're supporting and they're doing bionic uh, arms for amputees. And they're doing it uh, using uh, Arduinos and uh, 3D printing. And so they're able to provide an arm that can be customized to someone for like a thousand dollars when those type of arms would cost 50 or 70 thousand uh, dollars if you buy them from a US company. So they are on the ground, local, in Africa, from countries that don't have the means, and they understand that this is critical. One, they know that there's many amputees in Africa, but two, they also know that they can't afford. So they developed something for the local market. And that's for us is innovation. Now, is that like cutting edge deep learning? Maybe not, but it's definitely innovation. So that is very interesting. But sometimes innovation manifests itself by what Avi was saying, which is like this multicultural different approaches. And if we mix uh, all those backgrounds, then they we come up with some ideas. Like we have a startup uh, that we're supporting in Africa and they developed uh, an educational kit about uh, raspberries, uh, which is like Arduino, like some uh, microcontrollers. And they'd go in schools and teach the kids, uh, well not kids because those are 18 year old, how to build a solar panel using off the shelf components and by doing this they have a workshop, they learn how to build a solar panel but what's most important is that this is a solar panel that they're actually using because they don't have electricity in their villages and so now they gain the knowledge about how to maintain and develop those things and they actually use this innovation for really impactful things, so they don't have to burn kerosene to get lights. And, and this is another example of innovation, which again, like we're not talking crazy deep uh, technology, but the outcome is uh, killing two birds with one stone, educating and providing a solution. So there's plenty of opportunities for innovation, and I think uh, we just need to encourage more entrepreneurs uh, to think outside the box, give them those stories, those examples, so everyone is empowered to really have an impact. And, and you mentioned the 30 and the 60 year old. It's the same story here. We need to go to those people and not wait for them to come to us. So when we run the next uh, iFair program of innovation, we need to make sure to, make, to be inclusive and to reach out to those remote areas where they're not usually uh, mingling with those young people. So let, let's get the young techies to go to those places and see what kind of magic we can do here. Add something which is uh, related to something you just mentioned that we should go go to those people. So I'm looking at you now, not only you, but uh, what I'm trying to say is that we have a problem today because of the advertisement systems uh, that are somehow w when when I want to 
to market, you know, an Arduino course, okay, to people, you know, to, uh, to people, uh, not, not young people. So I get leads, you know, Facebook, I'm yeah, not talking about Google, of course, just Facebook. Yeah. Uh, so the, uh, the expert is talking to me and he says, look, let's, let's analyze the leads, okay, let's analyze the leads. And uh, look, you know, you know, get it, it's clear that most of the people who click on your lead are men, not women. So why are you wasting, wasting your money? You know, let's not advertise for women. I got this advice, by the way. I got this advice. And this is a problem. This is, this is against the multidisciplinary uh, approach because, you know, you are, you, are, you are advertising just to the people who are just interested in this thing. And of course, I am not, a, I'm not an economical institute or so, but if I was, if I was like have a competitors, I don't know what I will do. I have, a, I, have to have to, I have to go to competition. So this is, by the way, I think the role of the government or the uh, or the big companies to fight this and to that my my daughter will get the same advertisement as his son whatever okay thank you thank you guys very very interesting uh, perspectives on a very uh, important topic um, i ask our audience to join me in thanking our panelists for their wonderful contributions and we move on to our next <laughs> program Thank you. You can take your seats in, uh, with the audience. Uh, next, we're moving on to a discussion, and I have the honor to present to you um, two people who will be having this discussion in front of us. Uh, first is uh, Ms. Teddy Mugabo, who is CEO of Rwanda Green Fund. Prior to her appointment as Chief Executive Officer at Rwanda Green Fund, Ms. Teddy Mugabo served as the head of business development at the same institution. In a previous role, she coordinated efforts to mobilize resources towards the country's green ambitions. Ms. Mugabo holds a postgraduate science degree in climate change and development from the University of Sussex and Institute of in, in Development Studies. She also has a Bachelor of Science in Biology from Hannibal Lagrange University, Missouri, United States. She boasts eight years of experience in climate change and environmental sector. So, welcome. And together, we also have uh, Princilia Boagwe, uh, head of Pan African Institutions, Government Affairs, and Public Policy in Google. For nearly two decades, Princilia Boagwe has helped to advance humanitarian, economic, health, environmental, and tech policies in Africa. Before joining the State Department, she led a non profit organization that provided humanitarian assistance in Cote d'Ivoire. Princilia currently serves as Google's head for Pan-African Institutions, Government Affairs and Public Policy, where she oversees policy engagement with the African Union Commission, United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, African Development Bank, among other regional organizations. So, Princilia, go ahead. Testing, okay, excellent. If you love Africa and you know it, clap your hands. If you love Africa and you know it, clap your hands. If you love Africa and you know it, and you're not afraid to show it. If you love Africa and you know it, clap your hands. Excellent, good evening everyone. I know it's been a long day, day two of COP, okay, hang with us. This is a really exciting conversation. I'm very excited to be here. I'm from Google's team in Africa. And Google is very excited about supporting startups and innovation in Africa, especially as we look at the opportunity for economic growth, right? And what does this mean for the young and growing population that we have on the continent? Uh, so we will be talking to you today in your role. I would love for you to talk to us exactly what you do and what the Rwanda Green Fund does. Um, but as we look at the startups on the continent, we've attracted over $4 billion this year. 81% of that has gone to Nigeria, Kenya, Ghana, South Africa, and Egypt. But 16% is going to other countries, including Rwanda. 
So we know that there are some countries that are getting it right, that are attracting investment, and that are driving innovation on the continent. So talk to us about the Rwanda Green Fund. What is it doing? How is it working? And what can we learn from it, more importantly? Thank you. First of all, thank you, Ido, for the invitation. Uh, really a pleasure to be joining this very important conversation. Um, so my name is Teddy Mugabu. I'm the CEO of the Rwanda Green Fund. It's a government fund uh, that really was established with a mandate to mobilize the financing, the climate financing needed um, to support uh, our country achieve its uh, climate, uh, climate action and climate agenda goals. Uh, so we've been, put in, we've been in place for the last 10 years. Um, and what's, um, I think what's unique about the fund is that uh, we have, we're able to fund both public and private sector. Uh, and, uh, and over the course of, so over the last 10 years, we've mainly mobilized traditional financing and supporting public investments. So about two years ago, um, we conducted a market assessment because we didn't feel like we were supporting the private sector the way we wanted to. And you know, so we, we, had, uh, we had two instruments, an innovation and R&D grant and a line of credit, but even with those two instruments, um, we were still struggling to get, um, you know, like applications from the private sector. So what we did is we, we conducted a market assessment to really understand, and I think a lot of the issues that were being discussed earlier um, is that you know, if we were, if one, um, we, have to write, we have to have in place the right instruments that cater to our private sector. So in Rwanda, we have a, a, a very, I would say that the private sector is still very young, and some might not necessarily need financing. Um, actually, some needed business development support. So we had to really understand and say, what do, you, what do they need? And then from there, we had to develop the instruments accordingly. So I think for me, the key message here is that when we want to support startups, we also can't just apply, you can't just use one instrument because different startups are intervening in different sectors, but they're also at different um, stages of the business life cycle. So from there, um, uh, actually yesterday, we launched uh, a, a green investment facility by the name of IREME. We're very, very happy that our president actually officiated this, but the whole um, essence of this investment facility is to use a blended finance approach uh, whereby we will keep mobilizing grant funding, but then use the grant funding to support the early, st you know, the, the so early stage business stuff support, and from there build a pipeline of bankable projects that can then unlock uh, the private investments. So that's, maybe that's what I can say. I think it's very, very important that we put in place different instruments. So we'll be offering grants, reimbursable grants, some debt financing, some guarantees, um, and, and through, all, through these products, um, we can then be able to support our private sector, especially the startups. So tailored financing. Thank, Thank you. You're sitting here all humble about the amazing achievement that you did yesterday. Can you tell us, okay, first of all, they raised $100 million in one day. They launched yesterday, so I think we need to clap for that. Thank you, thank you. She's sitting like a regular human, but well, she's not. We raised it yesterday, but it, it takes a while. Yes, it takes We've a while. been working on it for the last years, but it's true. Um, it, again, I think, the biggest, biggest struggle is finding the pipeline. I, I honestly believe that there's a lot of money out there, um, but it's how do we make sure, one, that we also attract the right funding? Because sometimes we've been able to attract financing and then it's not, we've not been able to deploy it because it, it comes with a lot of conditions. And So um, I think spending the time to understand the market, designing the right instruments and building that pipeline and then the money, I honestly believe that the money flows uh, from there. So what can be learned from what you are doing? It's obviously effective. You're able to grow and expand. So what can be learned from your example and scale perhaps to other African countries? Uh, thank you. So I think it's really vice versa because I also believe there's a lot we can learn, especially from Ghana and Nigeria. Um, I think one, it's important to have um, you know, financing mechanisms in place. So um, having the Rwanda Green Fund uh, as a national fund, it has really enabled uh, us to mobilize financing that caters for the solution, that, you know, comes and also uh, provides solutions for the local market. So that's one thing that I keep, when, whenever we meet other countries, I think it's very important to have the right financing mechanisms. It's not, I don't think every country would have the same because different countries are set up differently, but 
if you don't have the right financing mechanism, sometimes money will flow, but might not necessarily go into the, you know, where, where it's needed. So that's one. Um, but the other point I wanted to make is that we also need to find ways in which we can transfer the knowledge. Um, so for example, you know, in East Africa, we might be working on, I don't know, a solution, for example, around electric mobility. A lot of the times we don't need to reinvent the wheel. So for me, I think what was interesting just listening is how do we create um, these synergies and how do we share knowledge? I mean, what's in Israel might not necessarily be the same as Rwanda, but I also believe that it might not be quite different. So, I, you know, we, it's good to be innovative, but uh, where we can also <laughs> learn and sort of uh, bring in the technologies and from, from Israel to Africa, I think there's also a great opportunity to, to, um, yeah, to, to, to look into. And what can you tell us about the public-private partnership aspect of this? I know that you, are, you have some private funding and you are also funding the private sector. Okay. Um, so part of what Ido was talking about earlier on is the importance of this collaboration. Um, if you can talk to us a little bit about that. Thank you. Uh, actually, I have a colleague of mine, Vazil, <laughs> in the room. Um, so he is the CEO of, uh, it's called the Green City Kigali uh, it's company. And uh, so basically, we've, uh, we, we want to build uh, what a sustainable city should look like. So one of the things we believe in Rwanda is that if you, we have policies, but in order to really adopt or for people to understand, you, didn't, you need to demonstrate. So, um, so Rwanda has an ambitious, and you know, ambitious NDCs, and we want to actually develop in, su in a sustainable banner. But so we do this by implementing, you know, projects such as the Green City. So the reason why I'm emphasizing on this is that we've been able to mobilize grant funding up, I believe, up to 40 million, 40 to 50 million euros, and and uh, and uh, to do the feasibility studies and the sort of project preparation and. And then now we'll be out there looking for a, a private investor to come on board. So I hope Basil <laughs> is able to communicate. But these are the kind of projects that I see uh, the potential for PPPs to, to come into where we're working on a project. We mobilize some grants, um, but you know, in order to really scale or construct, or that's where there's a, there's, I see the, 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 the potential to bring in private investors from you know, Israel or other parts of the, of the world. Yeah. Do you have some examples? Erwin, who runs our Project 2030 previously, was talking about how do we leverage technology to solve some of our most pre pressing problems. Um, so with some of the startups that you funded, what are some positive examples that you've seen of how that's being done? Um, thank you. So I believe we can do more, which is why we launched this facility yesterday. Um, we want to support more and more startups. But a an example I can give that has been successful is uh, so a, a startup company by the name of Ampersand, the into electric mobility, um, back in 2018, they applied for a grant funding. So the fund provided a, a grant of a, around $180,000, where they were testing electric motorcycle, you know, like the, the battery swapping and, and sort of that technology. And at the time, um, we didn't have any electric mobility in the country. So we provided a, a, the, the grant of 180000 and as, as we speak right now, Amperson has been able to mobilize venture capital of more than $30 million. So for us, those are the kind of successes we want. We're like, how can we do more of this? How do we, because it's really, um, I think we need to provide more pension capital. Like how do we sort of, you know, just, I, we, we know it's risky, uh, but if we don't take the risk and uh, to invest in these startups, then we might actually also be missing an opportunity. So that's one example, and that's sort of, the, 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 the project that sort of was like a wake up call, where like if, if they've managed to do this, uh, we need to mobilize more, more uh, grants, but with really with the end goal of attracting private investor investments. Thank you. And so how do, when, when we have an example that is so successful in your country and they want to scale beyond Rwanda, what are some of the challenges that you know, you're facing or that these startups are facing in expanding beyond their own countries? Um, that you think could be addressed, perhaps by better coordination or harmonization of regulations? So actually, Ampersand has expanded. <laughs> so they're expanding to uh, Uganda and I believe Kenya. So I'm, I, I'm not in the best position to answer that because you know, I, they probably have more, um, more, uh, more ideas, but 
maybe just to think, I think obviously different countries have different regulatory frameworks and, um, you know, so it might not be as easy as, uh, as it is, but, but we also have different um, networks and so for example, the ESC, the East African community. So within the regions, I believe there's also the always uh, different platforms uh, that these can use to, to expand their businesses. So um, unfortunately, I don't have the right answer, but that's what I can say uh, about that, yeah. Thank you so much. So I think we're going to wrap up here. You've shared some really important information about how exactly you are attracting investment, how you are supporting innovation in Rwanda as a positive example that other countries can learn from, but also how you can learn from other countries, such as Israel, um, and, and do some information sharing and hopefully grow and grow beyond Rwanda and across borders, across the continent. Um, so we've had a very interesting conversation. Welcome any closing remarks before we wrap up this panel from you. Um, so my closing remarks, uh, I think if we really are to address the climate issue, uh, we definitely need innovation, innovation, um, but also finance. So, but the right financing. So for me, those are the two things innovation and, uh, and, and tailored financing. So this was really interesting conversation. Uh, I'm just listening to the previous speakers. I, I believe that we, we all need to take that risk and invest in startups because we never know what's going to come out of there. And but also at the end of the day, thinking about the climate action that uh, we've all gathered here to, to address. Thank you. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Very interesting. Thank you very, very much for this. It brings to my mind that there is a sort of a contradiction in terms in the essence. As you look at uh, innovation, you think about spontaneity and doing things, just, just doing it, just starting and doing something. And on the other hand, you hear the need for planning, for financial, sustainable uh, financial planning. So there is a huge tension there. And uh, very clearly, different parties have to work together and get to know what others are doing to benefit from each other's work. So thank you very much for this. I appreciate it very much. Uh, moving on to our uh, startup uh, entrepreneurs, uh, private and uh, also from academia. So let me just very shortly and briefly introduce them to you. Um, first, uh, Professor Yochai Kermel is a professor at the Faculty of Civil Environmental Engineering in the Technion Israel Institute of Technology. He joined the Technion in 2000 and established the Ecology Laboratory. He supervised 17 MSc students, 15 PhD students, and six postdocs. Among the diverse subjects of his research are the use of um, afforestation, uh, afforestation of for <coughs> climate change mitigation, spatial patterns of biodiversity, forest fire risk, theoretical principles of ecological communities and human evolution, where he's established a work group of philosophers of science, anthropologists, and biologists. Uh, next with us is uh, Simon Schwal, who is an entrepreneur and microinsurance uh, expert. He created OKO, OKO 2018, an Israeli startup that offers weather uh, index insurance for uh, to smallholder farmers in Africa. Uh, OKO uh, makes climate insurance, um, sorry, makes climate insurance accessible to anyone. Not no internet or bank account required, and is how is now available in Mali, Uganda, and Ivory Coast. OKO's impact on climate resilience was recognized as a Climate Finance Day, where OKO won the International Startup Prize in 2019. And um, last, but last but not least, uh, Angela. Um, Angela Homsi, founder Ignite Power, is an entrepreneur and invests in sustainable and climate technologies with experience across private and public markets, emerging markets investing, and business in post-conflict areas. She is co-founder of <coughs> Ignite Power, a decentralized infotech company deploying climate technologies for power, agriculture, remote health, and connectivity and infrastructure in Africa and the Middle East, working alongside governments and international stakeholders. Um, Angela speaks at multiple universities and summits globally, and she is Egyptian, Lebanese, Israeli, residing in the UAE. So 
all three of you uh, most welcome. Uh, Juhai, please, uh, you go ahead, you start, and then Simon, and then Angela. So, welcome. Take your seats. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. Can you all hear me? Yes. It's recorded, so we need the mic. Okay. So, I'm not only happy, I'm also frozen to be here. I was told Sharma Sheikh climate is hot, so I dressed accordingly. But then I came here, I feel uh, like we are still in Glasgow. Yeah, given the time constraints, I'll be very brief. I have some bad news and then a little bit of some good news. So, as some of you may know, the humanity as a whole contributes to the atmosphere every year some 40 gigaton carbon. Okay, much of it is, remains in the atmosphere and that's the source of elevated CO2. <coughs> but 30 important percents are absorbed by forests. So this is reasonable to assume that if we plant more forests, then we can take more carbon from the atmosphere. That's the common knowledge and people act accordingly. And people think, we, we might, you know, continue emissions because if we just plant a few more trees. Is this, this correct? Which way do I go here? That's the title of my our project that I led recently and in, in good timing, just a few weeks ago, it was accepted for publication in a science prestigious journal. So we can plant many forests in the islands. As you see here, 40% of the total land area is uh, the islands. Why don't we plant forests in areas that are humid? Okay. The reason is very clear. Areas that are humid are already taken by agriculture, urban areas, uh, industry, and sometimes small plots of existing forest. So there is no chance to plant large areas in the humid areas. So we still have this arid and semi-arid lands, dry lands we call them, that we can plant. There are restrictions though. We can't plant if it's too cold. We can't plant forests if it is too dry. We can't plant forests if the area is covered by other land users. And of course, if and so on. So we did the calculation and we found that the only areas that could be, can we reduce some of the lights over here? Is it possible? Because this map is not easy to see. You can see? Okay, good. So there are some remaining 1.5% of the dry lands that we could actually put forests on. And this is the green area here. And you see portions in up come out very important soon. So if we want to know what exactly the impact is going to be, we should calculate the carbon storage effect. Okay, we plant for us today. It's going to be continuing to... Can you hear me? Continue to absorb carbon till the rest of the century at least. And we can calculate how beneficial this is. But what is often neglected is the other side of uh, a plant forest, and it's called the albedo. Okay. When we take a bright area, a white area, okay, like sand, etc., and we put forest in, it becomes dark. Okay? It's like if we change from, from a white t-shirt to to black t-shirt, okay, we get hotter. The same goes for the earth. It be, if we paint large portions of the earth in, in forest, dark colors, it becomes hotter, okay? So to, for, for the total heat balance of the earth, we should also calculate the albedo effect. This was overlooked until
until nearly until uh, our study here. So we made the calculation globally. We accounted for both effects, three minutes, both heating and cooling effects. This is the net effect, okay? So if you see here, uh, as in orange, it means high warming effect, net, in spite of the carbon sequestration. If you see areas that have blue colors, that means cooling, net cooling effect. So y you can see here a picture, overall picture that's complex, okay? And the bad news is that even if we plant wherever we can, we still only compensate for mere 5% of the total emissions until the end of the century. The good news is that some in Africa, actually, the southern parts of the Africa are among the best places to put forest on if we do want to make an impact, as opposed to, for example, Turkey, where you see some good areas but many bad areas. So let me jump to the conclusions. Forestation should be smart and careful. And areas in South Africa and Angola are among the most important lands for afforestation. Um, if I have two more minutes, I present another project that's leaded by Professor Dani Akir. And I have a small portion there. And that's directly towards uh, Africa. Okay, we want to measure the impact of the land use change in Africa on atmosphere-biosphere interactions and on the climate in general. So you can see here, I mentioned already the importance of uh, forests for the climate system. You see Africa is the second largest tropical forest in the world. On the other hand, you can see how many uh, uh, measurement stations there are across the world, many continents, you can see them everywhere. Except in Africa, there are very few. So no wonder we know about the ecosystems of Africa, we know very little. And uh, putting in new stations is very costly. But here we, with the support from our government, we found a way to do it differently, okay? We are aiming at closing the information gap regarding Africa ecosystems and the role in the climate system using a mobile laboratory. That's a TAC, okay? We have many instruments inside it. We have a pole that is, uh, the height can go up to 30 meters, but it can be adjusted. For example, if we measure shrubland, we only need low pole. Measure forests, we have high pole. Okay, and we can do all these kinds of measurements and come up with some deep understanding uh, regarding the role of land use change and how it's going to affect the climate. So this is an example of the project that we already conducted in Israel. We measure forest versus Berlin in, in different places in a along a climatic gradient. And we intend to do a similar project in Africa use the mobile lab to locate the tag in different places across, okay, the in, in, in agricultural land, grazing land, grasslands, and shrublands and forests, and find out much better about your precious continent. Thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, so I'm next. I'm Simon. It uh, might not sound like it, but I'm from Israel. And it doesn't look like it, but I'm an African entrepreneur. And I think that's why I've been chosen to come here, because I create this link between uh, Africa and Israel in terms of uh, innovation. So I'm the CEO and founder of OCO. Um, actually, I have this here. Okay, so let me introduce you to Sané. Sané grows corn in a small plot of land in Mali. Um, and his family, he's, a, he's the father of three kids. Um, and here's the situation. If it doesn't rain before the end of, of this week, 
Sané might lose all his income, all the revenue uh, that him and his family are expecting for the next six months. You might find that it's shocking, it's, it's, uh, it's frustrating, but it's the situation for the largest part of the world population. 500 million families around the world are living from unirrigated fa farming. So what we do at, at OCO is we bring insurance to those farmers. We make sure that if they suffer a bad season, they will have enough resources to prepare the next season and to take care of their family. So why are these African farmers not insured today? The reason is that traditional insurance doesn't work for these farmers. Sending an expert on site to verify the damages that they've been suffered, such a suffering, it's not scalable. And how do you bring insurance to someone like my friend Sané, who lives far from any city, has no bank account, and no financial education? Well, we use new technologies. We use mobile. Um, with OCO, anyone with a phone, and it doesn't need to be a smartphone, it doesn't need to have connection to the internet, anyone can access our insurance product, register, and pay in a few clicks. Farmers dial a code, and they uh, share with us the location, the size of the farm, uh, what they grow, and we, we send them a personalized quote. Farmers can then pay using mobile money and they receive ins insurance automatically. And then we monitor the weather at the location of their farm using satellite data. And if we observe that they've been suffering from a drought or a flood, they automatically receive a financial compensation. They don't need to make a claim, they don't need to wait on the phone, they don't need to visit uh, an insurance office, we tell them that they are eligible, we send them the money. We're looking here at 500 million farms who can all spend, according to our uh, current experience, about $17 twice a year for insurance. So this is not just a social problem that we can solve, it's a huge business opportunity. We estimate it's about $17 billion of premium that we could collect every year. So we started this in Mali. We, sent, we recruited, trained, and sent agents on the ground to interact with farmers, uh, educate them about insurance, and uh, help them register. And we already cover, we already insure 17,000 hectares of land, making us the largest crop insurance in Mali. Our business model is pretty simple. We work with a local insurer. We take a part of the premium, and we use this to design the product distribute it, and uh, do the claim verification. We have signed partnerships with major uh, organizations in, in Africa. Alliance, the insurance company that is present in many countries. Orange, the mobile operator. And Touton, a company that is dealing with uh, cocoa production and uh, export, and who became an investor in OCO. And we are present in, now in Mali, in Ivory Coast, and in Uganda. So that's OCO in a nutshell. Basically, we are unlocking an opportunity for insurance companies and insurance companies of up to $17 billion, as I explained. We can provide a solution that is impacting 500 million farming families around the world. And we do this using mobile, and so that's why Orange is partnering with us. We can boost uh, the adoption of mobile uh, financial services. So that's uh, also a benefit of our solution. Now, I created a few more slides to talk about uh, the Israel-Africa relationship. And first thing was, why is innovation such a, why does it need to be such an integral part of an effective solution for Africa? So the startup model and in the innovation model today um, is about scalable solution. And that's super re relevant for Africa where there are large scale problems to solve. Uh, so in our, in our case, for example, we use solutions with a continental, continental scale. We use satellite uh, data that has a good continental coverage. And if it works in Mali, it can be replicated everywhere in the continent. Second thing is that the, um, the lack of uh, infrastructures require, but also allows new solutions. Uh, in a market where there is already um, insurance, that where there are already uh, weather stations everywhere or, or, or sensors, it doesn't make as much sense, but in, in Africa where there's a lack, as you say, of, uh, of weather station, um, using this kind of redefining insurance, re, re, uh, reimagining insurance, 
is possible. Farmers don't have the same expectations about what insurance is. They don't know about insurance today. So we can create a, pr a, pr a product from a, from a white page, from a blank page, and create something that is uh, relevant for uh, this market because we start from a blank, sl blank slate. Finally, innovation today, the model of innovation is using what we call lean management, which is basically starting quickly, failing quickly, and uh, bringing a, a product very quickly to market. And that's something that is very relevant, again, for Africa, uh, where the solution needs to come quick. It doesn't need to be perfect. Again, the expectations from uh, the, uh, the customers are different. This is an illustration of a car that was built, uh, I think, in Ghana, by Ghanaians, for Ghanaians. So it's, uh, it's easy to repair, it's easy to, uh, to handle, it's robust. Uh, so yeah, this lean innovation method is really relevant for Africa. Second thing, uh, I was asked to explain what, what is the Israeli ecosystem and how it, it is a catalyst of innovation. And there is abundance of, uh, of knowledge of innovation because of the research and military, because of the Ternion, the Weizmann Institute, etc. But in our case, I wouldn't say that it's the really what brought uh, innovation, what triggered our innovation. It's more about the society. So it's a society of immigrants in Israel. A lot of uh, people immigrate and have to start their career, start a new uh, career. And this was my case. And it gave the opportunity, it gives the op opportunity to people to create something new. And I think that this is something that is also relevant to Africa where there's a lot of mobility, where there are a lot of uh, repat repatriation, um, and that could be replicated in Africa. Finally, there is a support structure in Africa, in, in, uh, in Israel, that uh, now is brought to Africa. So Google, for example, is supporting us and has now opened uh, resources in, in Ghana, for example. Uh, we have other, ins other institutions like the PES program, the Tech for Good, etc. Finally, Afri uh, partners creating partnerships with between Israel and Africa. So it's super, it's super important for us because we cannot rebuild everything. So in our case at OCO, we partner with Flutterwave, with MS West Africa, with MTN, with Eco, OCO, Eco Bank. These are all African companies that have a continental scale and that can allow us to reach all the markets in Africa. Second thing is that they have the, the local entities have the knowledge about the uh, local community. So we need to work with them to understand what are the solutions that work and that have the most impact. So we work with, for example, the, um, the cotton um, industry in Mali, and we co-design the products with them. Finally, they can help the local um, African partners can help us navigate the local ecosystem. So in Uganda, for example, we work with the Agro Insurance Consortium that understands, uh, that can deal with the government to get subsidies that can uh, create partnerships with the local insurance companies, which is something we cannot do. Now, something I didn't talk about here, but sounds relevant to me now, if we have one more minute, is why the African uh, organization should partner with Israel. So in Israel, what you will find is uh, companies that really need a larger market. Israel is a tiny market, uh, and while if you go to the US to try to find an innovation, they might not be interested in a small market like Mizutu or like Rwanda, um, you come to Israel and you will find entrepreneurs that need to find uh, markets that are bigger than Israel to uh, bring their solution. You also have find um, science and uh, R&D and innovations with these institutes that I mentioned before. And again, these are solutions that, that work for Israel to develop agri agriculture very quickly from uh, almost nothing and that are very relevant to Africa. So I'll stop here. Uh, I hope I made my point that uh, yeah, there, there are strong bridges to make between Israel and African countries, and it goes both ways. Uh, Israel can benefit from uh, the large markets in Africa, and African players uh, can really benefit from the R&D and the innovation that you can find in Israel. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. I won't be very long since I'm the last one between dinner, you know, <coughs> the end of the day and dinner. I'll try to go quickly. Just if we can get those slides, fantastic. So I'll just tell you very briefly about what we do at Ignite. What, what, what we're trying to do here is build basically what we believe is the future of infrastructure. 
Uh, the future of infrastructure means infrastructure that leaves no one behind, that can be plugged for everyone and everywhere. Um, in the context of Africa, the model that we developed over there is basically based in three Ds, decentralized, distributed, and digitized. And those three Ds very quickly lead you to another three Ds, which is that infrastructure can become democratized and reach everyone out there, uh, demonetized by having everything done through digital payment, which is one facet of our work, and is doable now. We have everything in place to actually implement it. And you know, really, when you look at the future of infrastructure, and you look at the continent of Africa, we know that there, Africa is one of the least you know, contributor to climate change. Yet, we keep on telling Africa, okay, wait with your development because you cannot join the carbon overdose that the West has done. So what we need to do is really find a way to build that infrastructure in a way that you, you, you deal with sustainable economic um, development with infrastructure in a way that is green, entirely green, in a way that is inclusive and safe and resilient for all. Um, and so if you look at it, that's across different parts of the infrastructure spectrum. You can do that for power with decentralized power. You can do that for healthcare with remote healthcare using solar energy and technologies that some of them that we build in, in Israel. And, and as well around connectivity and internet connectivity and agriculture. And we operate around all of these different um, um, verticals. Um, so, no need to read that, this is what I say, that we believe that basically um, uh, the role of infrastructure today is to reach everybody everywhere um, and leave no one behind there. And I'll just go very quickly first on a couple of numbers. So since we started doing our work at Ignite, working with governments and distributed technology across, the co across countries on the continent, in Rwanda in particular, which was our first country of operation so many years ago, um, we've already impacted like one and a half million people. Uh, we're in over 10,000 villages across the continent. Uh, we have over 3,000 employees and we were able to uh, save 120,000 uh, tons of, um, of, uh, of greenhouse gas emissions. And the way we've been looking, um, looking at that in particular is it is both about mitigation and, um, and, and basically as well uh, making sure that the infrastructure that we're building, because they're distributed, are way more resilient. So that's a model that we apply in Africa because there, there is a social imperative to make sure that infrastructure gap is bridged, is bridged in a green way. But those models can as well be applied across the world. And we really believe that what we're doing on the continent will eventually, you know, around the leapfrog mentality that everybody knows about, will eventually be implemented in California, uh, in the whole of Europe. I read an article about the UK recently, and in a lot of other uh, markets where greed are becoming complex to navigate and very often an economical to reach the last mile. I want to just touch base, so the model obviously is to go from a centralized, greed-based, often dirty or polluting uh, ways of dealing with all this infrastructure, power, and, and the other ones, to be doing everything in a way that you have like distributed networks, technological networks that are connected. Um, that's as well much better in terms of speed, because you can see that the penetration is on par with the penetration of smartphone or internet rather than with the penetration with old school infrastructure. So the technological penetration to reach the millions of people that we need to reach is much faster. We connected already one and a half million people out there. We're now on a plan supported thankfully by Citibank uh, to actually reach 100 million people within the next five years. Um, and that's extremely doable. This is not even a, a very ambitious target. A lot more can be done. Um, we're doing it across different parts of the life enabling infrastructures that are needed. And I wanted to come very quickly to that slide, and it's gonna be almost my last slide, to talk about what Shira said as well earlier. So what does it mean to do what we're doing in technological term? Imagine you have great technologies, hardware and software, and you need to provide them to a billion people, right? Like the part of the population that actually needs those things now. So you need to have a model almost like Amazon to be able to put it everywhere you need on the last mile, Except that this is an Amazon that is going to places where people have no internet and electricity to start with, so they cannot kind of go online and order it, right? Uh, there is almost very often no addresses, no bank accounts. Uh, there's no roads sometimes where we're going. So how do you develop a last mile 
a sustainable last mile operation that can reach every one of those people in the way that makes sense for the business and that makes sense for the sustainability of the project. That's exactly what Shira was talking about, is having a whole platform of enabling technologies that enable your platform to operate with state-of-the-art deployment, verification, data, every, every path of the way. By the way, in our team, we have some long-term expert in carbon credits. Because we use such digitized way of doing things with very strong verification models embedded to it, we straight away um, um, uh, can actually um, tokenize them into carbon credits, which is as well a very powerful thing with a market that is obviously booming at the moment. And that's, you know, our, our tech team is all based in Israel. Um, our uh, financial team is based in the UAE and all our operations are across Africa in the countries where we operate um, uh, across the continents. So this is the verticals that we're tackling with. So this is the platform basically of what you need to do in order to make that possible. Um, and that's really the way we're looking at our company. It is a digitized platform that is enabling us to tackle different vertical of soft and hard infrastructure. Um, so that, that's all I wanted to say and present to you today. I don't want to make it long because I know you guys have been here for a very long time. A very long time. Uh, but with Ignite, we, you know, we couldn't do it alone. So we've been working with partners across the spectrum uh, from you know, the World Bank, which has been a very strong partner of ours uh, for innovative finance modeling. Like we do a lot of innovative finance called Result by Finance. By the way, come on Friday, we'll be talking about that at the Honda Pavilion with, some, with Teddy and a few other people. Uh, we work very closely as well with IRENA. We were the first ever, IRENA is based in Mazdar City in Abu Dhabi, for those who know it, they have a pavilion here, the International Renewable Energy Agency. Uh, they used to give an award to G2G, government to government, for the most ambitious government project on renewable energy. For the first time, and I think last time, because they stopped now those awards, they gave it to a private company, which was Ignite, a few years ago. And that's why an Israeli company ended up in Abu Dhabi. Um, and that was five years ago because we work again at national scale with government to make sure that this becomes the future of infrastructure for all. That's it. Thank you. All right, guys. Uh, I'd like to speak to thank all our speakers and to thank you guys for uh, staying with us, hanging on with us throughout this uh, evening. It's been very, very exciting and very interesting. And I uh, wish us all a great continuation of innovation together with Africa and, uh, and a bright future in all aspects. So thank you very much and have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you.